get ready to introduce Dr. Harris. It's my pleasure this morning to introduce Dr. Harris um, as he takes over the mic here in just a moment. Um, when we were planning this training series, I went back in time when I had an opportunity to have him deliver some probably similar information, and I'm sure he's got some new information for us. And it was um, really valuable to me in my life as a parent to be able to take some of the advice that he had given. And I actually put some of that advice into practice during these challenging COVID times of having children at home, trying to adjust uh, boundaries and schedules. So it's my pleasure this morning to introduce Dr. Jim Harris. He is the Associate Director of the West Virginia Autism Training Center at Marshall University and the owners of Opportunities Consulting Services. He has worked with children and families throughout his career as an early interventionist, parent educator, educational consultant, and behavioral health therapist. Dr. Harris has presented at a variety of conferences from the local to the international levels on such topics as behavioral intervention, parenting, positive behavior support, trauma-informed care, organizational change, and many more. He has also worked with a variety of public and private entities, including the Fred Rogers Company, the United States Department of Education, the Ohio Association for the Education of Young Children, and many more. Please help me in virtually welcoming Dr. Harris this morning. Thank you so much for being with us, Dr. Harris. You uh, take it over from here. Thank you, Melody. We sound so official. I like it. All right. Well, um, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be a part of uh, the web series again. I'm going to move some things around here just to make sure my technology is, is uh, fully cooperative. Um, there we go. This is the, the second um, session that I've given in, in this webinar series. Really appreciate the opportunity to come back. Um, you know, it, it is tough times, and I really applaud the efforts of the series to get information out to families, teachers, uh, community health folks, and just general community members. And I hope today the opportunity when Melody reached out to me and said, hey, what about that one, the, the one talk that you did at Woodsdale Elementary? Uh, in Ohio County a few years back. Uh, I really like that content and, and think it might be really relevant right now. And I thought it was, it was a good fit for the series and a good fit for the needs of families right now. So um, what we're gonna talk about today is PBIS at home. And, and really what I've done with this is taken a lot of the lessons learned from school-wide positive behavior support and individual practices and positive behavior support and early childhood positive behavior support <coughs> excuse me, to try to create something that's very user friendly for families or some things to consider. Before I get too far into things, I always want to take a chance to uh, tell people about who we are at the Autism Training Center and what we do. Um, we, um, we are housed at Marshall University and we um, have three distinct departments. And those three distinct departments do uh, a variety of things, but I like to give people a quick overview of what those things are. The first one I'll mention is our college program. Our college program um, is a service program that's housed at Marshall where we serve degree seeking students at Marshall University with a clinical diagnosis of autism. So all of our students are um, standard Marshall students. They have the same admission criteria and everything else that any other Marshall student would have and they just so happen to have a clinical diagnosis of autism and our program is designed to support them in, in things like executive functioning, um, uh, social supports, things like that, that the, that the diagnosis of autism might make uh, college life a little more complicated for them. Um, but also, but at the same time, they're taking the same courses as any other student would in their, um, their, their ma major programs. And so we're really proud of that program. We're gonna have 57 students coming in this fall and uh, really, really proud. We're the first program in the country to do it. And not only were we the first, but we continue in our opinion to be the best program in the country. So if you know anybody out there that has a, uh, a teenager or a, an adult that's looking for getting into college and, and they have a clinical diagnosis of autism, uh, we're a great place uh, to look for for resources and support in that way. Another uh, program department we have is our direct service department. And that department is, is our oldest department and it's our autism specific and community based. And what we do in that program is everything from helping families with uh, identification information to community based education at at schools, at, in community centers, for camps, whatever it might be, all the way to online coaching, phone-based coaching, to even individual supports um, to families and teams around an individual with autism. So 
And our third department is our newest department, which is our Behavior and Mental Health Technical Assistance Center. And this is a product of our collaboration with the West Virginia Department of Education's Office of Special Education. And um, we have the West Virginia uh, School-Wide Positive Behavior Support Project in that department, the Early Childhood Be Positive Behavior Support Project in that department, and our Mental Health First Aid uh, Project in that department. And really proud of the work of all three of our departments. And the, the ATC is, uh, and we're, we're really, we've really kicked it into gear two now because we're really focused on helping folks uh, navigate these challenging times. So let's get right into it. So the first thing when we start talking about behavior support uh, in the home environment or in general, whether it be school, home, wherever, is, and it's just something that sounds strange that I stole from Tony Robbins, not stole because I cite his name at the bottom, but I've, I've, I've used a lot with folks because oftentimes everybody, when we start talking about behavior support, wants to get right into strategies. And I just, it's just premature. And the reason why it's premature in my mind is because there are so much that goes ahead of whether a strategy is going to work. There's state story and then strategy. State is what is the psychological and physiological state of the individual who we're asking to implement the strategy. Story is what is the person, what is the story the person tells themselves about the situation um, that they're getting ready to be implementing the strategy. And strategy is the actual thing. Let me give you a quick and easy example. Let's say I'm, I go into a, uh, a first grade classroom and there's a little guy with autism. And we know that autism commonly struggles with executive functioning, which is like, um, you know, uh, predicting the future, sequence, um, self-control, delaying gratification, <coughs> things like that. So I've got this little guy and I'm observing him and I think, you know what, this little guy would benefit from having a, a visual schedule. Because a visual schedule would help him to be able to predict and decrease his anxiety and increase his neurological energy and those kinds of things. But let's say that the, the educator that I'm working with in that situation um, doesn't really believe that this kid really has autism and he thinks he's just kind of being spoiled and, and that a visual schedule is not really necessary. So the story for that person isn't going to match the strategy. So even if I make the best visual schedule and do a fancy YouTube video or whatever it might be, if the person doesn't have the story that matches the strategy, they're really not likely to implement that strategy. And if we back it up even to state, if I've got a person who um, let's say they have lots of personal issues, and lots of medical problems and things like that, and they're so overwhelmed by their own physiological and psychological state, um, they're probably gonna struggle to implement strategies too. So oftentimes we, if we go right to strategies, um, that is premature. And so I think the, we, uh, the first talk I gave was on self-care. If you didn't get a chance to check that out, I think it, it, the content in that could be helpful. And then story is going to be when we talk about things like mind shift. Uh, some great authors when you start talking about behavior is Stuart Shanker's book on self-reg, is anything by Ross Green, anything by Dan Siegel, those kinds of books, anything by Bruce Perry if you want to look specifically at trauma. Um, so these kinds of books will help revise the stories. Um, you know, of course, in the world of autism, anything uh, by Temple Grandin is, is, is fantastic. Uh, she's got a, lot, a great series as well. Um, so when we start looking at these ideas of improving our stories, now the strategies start to make more sense. Now, I don't want to make this a COVID-19 talk, but I do want to make sure that folks understand that the state of folks, obviously, is going to be challenged right now because of the anxiety that COVID-19 has created. And the reason why COVID-19 has created so much anxiety is because anxiety is based off fear of the unknown, which is what's gonna happen. Our brains are pattern-seeking devices. So what that means is we are, at, at the earliest stages of learning, the brain is coding patterns. And it codes patterns in order to predict the future. So what it does is it watches, see, I see A, I see B, and then C happens. So in my brain codes then A plus B equals C, which helps me to predict the future in, in the sense of the pattern. If I see a similar pattern like this in the future, A plus B, I can prepare myself physiologically and psychologically for C. Um, it's, it's map making, so to speak. So you know how to navigate the world because you can predict what certain things, what sequences will result with certain outcomes. So what COVID's done is it's increased anxiety because we've not, we've not, dealt with anything like this before. So now we have this large unknown, which is increased the overall neurological load on folks, which has compromised everybody's state. Now I would argue, and I just said this in the, I said this in the, uh, the first webinar that I did, we can't universally say that COVID's been traumatic and we, for everybody because it's affected people in different ways. So not only do you have the difference in the financial and the social impact that it's had on folks, but you also have 
the neurological predispositions, the current coping skills and prior history that complicates what makes trauma versus not and things like that. I can tell you though that a lot of us, parents, teachers, folks in general, I've just did two different webinars with uh, two different county level leadership groups talking about you know, re-entry. And, and one of the things I want folks to understand is this new environment that COVID has created um, or our response to COVID that, that's created this environment is taxing our regulatory capacity and creating regulatory fatigue. So, and the reason why is anxiety, fear of the unknown, pattern disruption disrupts our, uh, it creates anxiety because it creates more unknown. So, and the example I gave, just to kind of bring this more personal for us all, is like, I'm pretty, I've, I've felt quite confident going to the store. Like I know how to go to the store. I know where to get stuff. I know how to uh, go through aisles. I know how to stand in line. I know how to pay all these kinds of things. But now going to the store has increased my neurological load because uh, not only do I have to, um, now I've got to worry about wearing a mask. Now I've got to worry about where other people are. Now I've got to worry about what I'm touching, what I'm wiping off. Um, now I've got to worry about how to stand in line at the, at the checkout. So now going to the store, which was a novel activity or a, a, a very basic activity before, has a higher neurological load. And it's the other things, you know, the hand washing being more of a focus as an idea. The plexiglass barriers is an obvious thing that, you know, the plexiglass barrier communicates um, protection. And the only reason you have protection is because of danger. So the brain, when it sees plexiglass barriers, it has to decode that as, this is protection because of danger. And that's true. You know, I think about, there was a time, I won't say exactly where in the country, but I was uh, in a place in, in a state that was a uh, more uh, dangerous part of the city. And I went in to get gas and I went in to pay and get something, some snacks or whatever. And uh, behind the, the cash register and everything was behind a plexiglass uh, barrier and you had to pay through a drawer and all that. Well, I knew I was in a rough part of that town, but when I saw that plexiglass and all that, it just increased my anxiety because like, wow, that is clearly a symbol of the danger that this situation could, pre could present. So understanding that we're all in a state of regulatory fatigue because our patterns have been disrupted, which is gonna compromise our ability to implement strategies to a certain degree. The second part is stories. And the big part when I talk about stories with folks is I want folks to think about what their story is about kids. Now, the only way I know to address the story side is to educate ourselves better, to educate ourselves about trauma with folks like Bruce Perry, neurological development with folks like Dan Siegel, um, you know, autism with folks like Temple Grandin, to, to deepen our understanding of why kids do what they do, or Ross Green, or Heather Forbes. You know, those are some of our favorite authors at the TAC. But um, so the big shift that I find that is probably the most effective shift in story is the idea of it's not what's wrong with kids these days, it's what the kids need these days. What's wrong with kids these days um, creates a dichotomy with us and kids, it creates a conflict with us and kids. And the easiest way to think about that is, if you came home and your significant other or whomever was at the house, and they looked at you and you walked in the door and said, you know what, I've been thinking, and I've figured out what's wrong with you. That approach, I'm fairly certain for most people would not create an open communicate, communication dynamic. It would create defensiveness. Um, it wouldn't be, oh, well, yeah, let me go get a cup of coffee and we can sit down and you can tell me about all the ways I'm failing as a human. Um, that, that what's wrong with you creates uh, a criticism, which creates defensiveness, which creates separation. What do kids need these days? If you think of it from a visual standpoint, what's wrong with you is I'm facing off with you. What do you need is I'm standing alongside you and looking out at an environment to see what I might do to support you. So that to me is the major story shift that is most beneficial in supporting kids, whether they be students, whether they be um, uh, in, any uh, students or your own children. So what's the goal though? So the calibrating idea though is what is the goal that we have to think about when uh, supporting kids? Now, let me be very clear. Um, I, I, I joke about this. I want, my oldest son, we were, um, uh, it's been a little while back and it was all done in good humor, but he asked to do something and I told him no. And, and, uh, and he said, you're me. And I started laughing and I said, well, you're misunderstanding what my goal is as a parent. And he says, what do you mean? And I said, well, my goal is not for you to be happy. My goal is for you to be a functional adult. And then he yells into my wife, who happens to be an elementary school principal. Um, uh, Dad doesn't want us to have a happy childhood. My wife jokingly, of course, yells back, well, me neither. Uh, 
Now, all the joking aside, uh, I really do mean that. I, I'm not interested in raising uh, 100% of the time happy 13-year-old as much as I'm interested in raising a functional adult. I, I would love for them to have as many happy moments as possible, but I understand that when I'm helping a young person become an adult, there's going to be times where for purposeful discomfort, for uh, struggle, or when I can't save them from things and stuff like this. But I think that's something we can all get behind, which is the goal of behavior support is to build competency. Our goal behind behavior support is to help kids develop their capacity to cope and engage in the world. Because I know uh, that kids who learn how to deal with those, I'm just from the therapeutic experience that I've had, I've worked with some folks that they're, they, 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 the adults around them didn't prepare them properly for the adult life. And it was their, it was their burden to bear when they became adults because they weren't prepared for uh, the challenges of an adult life because they were uh, treated, they were nurtured or um, overindulged as children and, and didn't learn that. So I think that's a, something we can all get behind that is actually compassionate. It's not about hard knocks. It's not about uh, being mean to kids. It's about being thoughtful and compassionate for the future that they're gonna have to address. So what do we do? What do we do with strategies? How do we meet them where we are? I, I believe you have to start with the starting point is you can't make kids learn to behave. Uh, you can only create environments where that's more likely to take place. And that's something that we talk a lot about in the PBIS uh, community is understanding that it's about environmental design and it's about getting the most out of the environment to support the behavior that we want. Uh, when you hear PBIS, there's gonna be lots of misunderstanding about what it is. A, a common misunderstanding is it's all about being nice and positive. That's not at all what it is. The positive and positive behavior support is adding to the environment. It's like, what do we add? Positive doesn't mean like smiles and rainbows. It means addition. So positive, what I'm adding to the environment. And it's a framework and you'll see it uh, used in a variety of different of scenarios, environments, everything from uh, juvenile detention facilities, uh, correctional facilities, schools, uh, group homes, homes, all these kinds of places. But for today, what I'm gonna use is what's commonly used in the early childhood environment because I feel like it, it adapts or it translates better to the home environment than any of the other models because it, it's a little more complete. And it's called the pyramid model. I'll put the, the link down there at the bottom of that slide um, so you can learn more about it. Um, and again, I'm telling you, I'm using this out of context. I'm using this as uh, a home-based version, but it's, it's adopted from the early childhood world with the folks like Mary Lou Hemeter and Lisa Fox and those folks. Uh, our P EC PBIS coordinator, Amy Carlson, um, is the one that leads our efforts with this project in early childhood classrooms. So it's commonly called the pyramid model. And you'll notice that it has these pyramids. And, I, you know, everybody knows if you uh, do a talk, you've got to show a pyramid. So here's my pyramid. Um, it's that effective workforce at the bottom is going to be that state story stuff we just talked about. It's going to be the who. And then we start getting into nurturing relationships, high quality supportive environments, targeted social emotional supports, and then those intensive, intensive interventions. So let's start with nurturing and responsive relationships. It's at the bottom on purpose, obviously, because um, relationships create a context for learning. And you guys have heard me talk, anybody's heard me talk before has heard me talk about this example, which is learning and growth takes place in the context of relationships. If you look at this story, if you look at this picture, what you see in this picture is, this little kid, little, little baby wants to walk because he wants to get to his mom. So it's the relationships in our lives are what create the security that make us take risks. If you had kids of your own, you remember how it was. They'd be cruising on the couch. You, you wanted them to walk so you get just far enough away from them. You stick your arms out and they would walk to you. And you have to understand that the, the developmental gravity of that is that they're holding on to something that's working. And when you reach your hands out and tell them to come your way, you're asking them to take a risk. That's powerful because what they're having to do is let go of something that's working to take a risk to come to you. And the only way they're going to let go of that couch is if you're worth it. So if we're going to ask kids to grow, develop, change, challenge, be challenged, we have to create environments where that takes place. It's commonly a missed thing in, in, in families and in, edu in, in, in education environments that I see is everybody wants to get right to hard knocks. Everybody wants to get right to challenge, but they, they, they don't take a step back and look at, have I created an environment where risk is appropriate, where challenge is appropriate? Um, and this is a product of consistency and not intensity. Um, relationships are absolutely a product of that consistency. Sinek, Simon Sinek talks a lot about this, but the consistency of daily routines, nurturing opportunities, connection and relationship, not uh, we take a beach vacation every summer or the person who shows up and gives kids lots of gifts 
but isn't there for those consistent things. We know, and John Gottman's research out of the University of Washington talks a lot about this. He's probably one of the main people. You'll see these ratios be seven to one, five to one, three to one. The one that I've seen that has the science behind it is John Gottman. He, he wrote the book, Making a Marriage Work. He's written a variety of other books, uh, Raising Empathetic Children. Um, and, and his uh, concept is, you know, investing deposits and withdrawals. And what we found, what he's found in his research, and, and, and you don't take my word for it, go, go look into his content, is that that five to one ratio is where he's seen a lot of those uh, really good relationships flourish, which is when we got those five, five positives to that one negative, and the relationships seem to be struggling more, seem to be at that 0.8 to one ratio. And of course, this is plus or minus. But one of the things that I found is, helping to be more intentional in the deposit uh, uh, situation. And, you know, we, I've done this on an individual level with uh, family observation where you can observe a family situation and just simply do a T chart and have a plus on one side and a DC on the other side. And you can look at what, what, what level, like by tick marks, what positive interaction we're having versus what direction correction we're having. And most families, you know, what we'll find is there's a, a, a overwhelming majority of the communication is direction correction and a, and a smaller percentage is, is that positive communication. So what we try to work with whether it's in a school or whether it's in a family is first increasing the awareness of that ratio and then working on intentional practices to increase that ratio of positive acknowledgement whether it be through family breakfast, family dinner, uh, story time, certain routines, riding in the car without devices on, you know, these types of things. So intentional practices, writing a schedule, identifying activities, note structured versus unstructured. I'll give you an example of one that wasn't a, a huge favorite of some teenagers, but ended up being a really great uh, thing for a friend of mine. A friend of mine was, has uh, two older, two daughters who are teenagers, and he was saying, man, I just feel like they're, I'm, I'm with them sometimes, but I'm never really with them. And what he meant by that is the connection. They were losing some of the connection. And, and uh, one of the things we talked about, and he talked a lot about how devices had interfered with that relationship. And, and one of the things I suggested to him is, and this, one, and this is because I, we've got parenting figured out. I do not have parenting figured out. I fail daily. Uh, but one of the things we're really strong about is, um, you know, on short trips, um, you know, anything below an hour, uh, no devices. And the reason why, or, you know, you can't have earbuds in and all that kind of stuff is because, uh, we want those opportunities for dialogue, conversation, those kinds of things. And he implemented his was under 30 minutes. If we're in a car under 30 minutes, no earbuds. Um, I, I want we want to talk. And when it first happened, his daughter thought it was crazy, and they weren't a huge fan of mine because I, I was it was an idea that I had suggested to him. Um, but what was interesting about it is, is he said, "Man, that's made such a, a a growth in their relationship." And what's even interesting now is their friends will get in the car and his two daughters will tell him, Hey, we can't wear your buds in the car because we're just going up the road. And he says, it's just spurred such a dialogue in relationship building. Now, one of the things I'm always cautious of when I talk about relationships is I'm not telling you to be best friends with your kids. I'm talking about, uh, you, they still need a leader, um, but you can be a leader and facilitate relationships. We know that good leadership is, uh, has two real, it has a lot of components, but two key components are confidence and holding frame. So confidence is, do you have a plan and do you feel confident you're sticking with your plan? The second part is holding frame, which is how easy is it to knock you off your horse? How easy is it for you to melt down? How easy is it for you to lose control? I talk about even leaders in, in a business, for example, a leader who is um, anxious or a leader who communicates instability then facilitates instability in their team. So, you know, the same thing goes in a home. So you have confidence in, uh, you know, uh, you know your strengths, you know your weaknesses, but also you, you stick to the plans that you have, and, and, but, you're, but you're also flexible when things go wrong, which is holding frame, able to deal with it, those kinds of situations. The second part about a good home environment and positive behavior support, we got the relationship piece, intentional practices, those kinds of things. Now we start moving into the concept of highly supportive environments. Now, the great thing about highly supportive environments, this is oftentimes what's referred to as the Bandurian curve. You'll see a lot of people that will use this, call it different things. Brenda Smith Miles talks about rumbling and, and things of that degree. She's also another great author. Um, there's a lot of people that use this. A lot, you know, it's obviously the, the, the bell curve when, when talking about normal distribution, but the Bandurian curve is commonly how it's referred to in behavior. It's, environment is a preventative strategy. So the worst time to work on challenging behaviors when the challenging behavior is occurring. So what we really focus on is what are the things we can do from a preventative and a regulatory capacity to decrease the likelihood of these kind of meltdowns. So, <clears throat> excuse me, the first thing we look at is environmental design. 
This is something when I've worked with families, I think a lot of people haven't really thought about. I will say families with individual children with autism tend to be a little ahead of the curve on this one because autism, uh, you know, some children with autism respond very well to, uh, uh, you know, visual cues and things like that. And, and, and with communication challenges uh, uh, being a common issue with autism, you start to see where this is a more used strategy. Um, so what we, what I've talked a lot about is, you know, environmental design is what would WWDD, which is what would Disney do? You know, Disney World is the best environmental design company, in my opinion, because they know how to move people. They know how to do lines. They know how to um, create an environment that decreases the neural load um, in order, because here's the goal. Disney wants to decrease the neural load of the environment to give you as much energy as possible so you'll stay longer and spend more money period. They want you to have a great time. They want you to be have plenty of energy. So you'll go at 10 in the morning and stay until 10 o'clock at night. And during that whole time, you'll be spending money and so on and so forth. So, you know, it is interesting to see where financially motivated strategies commonly will give you some good ideas because the motivation is very clear. Um, so when we look at a home environment, you know, using things, I'll talk a little bit more about visuals in just a second, but Organizing stuff. If you have a kid with a regulatory challenge, and the, the big regulatory challenges I talk about are the four A's, autism, ADHD, ACEs, and anxiety. ACEs being adverse childhood experiences. If you don't know what that is, there's tons of research out or information out there about that. And anxiety. All four of those, all four A's, struggle with regulatory capacity. I would argue that all four of those, all four of those will do their best in an environment that's organized. Now, I'm not trying to tell people how to keep their house. But I am telling you that if you've got a chaotic house that's disorganized and messy, a kid with uh, one of the four A's will struggle more in that environment because it's not as organized, it's not as predictable, the environment isn't an extension of instruction. So environments that do really well are those environments that are very organized, well labeled and things like that. We've also seen that be used uh, with the use of visuals. Uh, the one on the upper left is actually it's a picture of a similar strategy. I worked with a family, we stole this from Pinterest years ago and it was a shower, it's a waterproof shower checklist. We had a, a kid who struggled with hygiene, he had some executive function problems, and anybody that's had boys especially knows that sometimes hygiene isn't always their strong suit from that 12 to 15 range especially. Um, so we used um, a shower checklist for this young man. We did a pre-teach session on what it meant to be successful in the shower. We put the checklist in the shower and he learned how to work through that checklist. That's using a visual. We've also seen visual schedules be very useful. This isn't a, then we also see things like first then is great for kids that struggle with uh, executive functioning and sequence um, and choice boards like you see in the bottom right hand corner. Uh, if you want more information with this, I actually put the links uh, and I may have to repost them because I think it only went to the panelists. Our WVATC YouTube page has some great information on how to use visuals and visual ideas, visual schedules, and things like that. You go in there and watch some of those uh, that we've uh, created. We can repost those because the YouTube channel for the WVATC has a lot of great videos and our YouTube channel for uh, the West Virginia Behavior Mental Health Technical Assistance Center has some great videos as well. Um, and also sensory strategies come into play. You know, we, we know that there's a lot of kids that struggle with sensory integration. I would suggest, and this is another thing I could put in the chat box, uh, the Sensational Brain website. Uh, Misty Chambers, who's our OT, that uh, is the OT for our diagnostic clinic that the ATC has that we partner with communication disorders and martial health and the physical therapy office and the social work department and the psychology department um, at Marshall. We have a teaching clinic there, which is a multidisciplinary clinic for autism diagnosis. Um, we, uh, Misty, who's our OT, recommends the Sensational Brain and the Brain, work, Brain Works app really great content, really user friendly if you need help with some sensory strategies for a kid. Uh, the next part we go into about a supportive environment is unifying our expectations and rules. Commonly one of the biggest things we find in behavior support that people struggle in is um, there, there are too many rules and it's too complicated. Um, so what PBIS in the school-wide world has done is really focusing on you know this idea of having three to five positively stated expectations for all people in all environments and then building it all within that structure. I, I, and I just said this to two different counties. I believe schools that are implementing PBIS, uh, school-wide PBIS, are gonna have a much easier time 
excuse me, at this reentry process because they're already going to have expectations that they're going to fold these COVID specific strategies into and they're already going to have uh, teaching systems that they're used to using. So they're going to be way ahead of the curve versus a school that's very dependent on exclusionary practices like detention and suspension or uh, uh, administrators that have that mentality of I don't take crap. They're going to have a harder time because they're not going to have the infrastructure to plug in these the necessary teaching systems. In a home environment, it goes the same way. Here's an example of, you know, a home environment. You know, we start you know, getting up in the morning school, homework time, meal time. And what you see is this is what we call behavioral matrix. And I don't have time to go into all the details of this, but this is an example of how we look at the expectations are on the left, which is help out, own your behavior, and manners count. Uh, that's, and then what we've done is you look at how those things look in each specific environment. That then will feed our teaching systems. Here's a more simplified ver version. Be respectful, be responsible, be ready. Commonly you'll see the be ready replaced as be safe. Be safe, be respectful, be responsible. In my house, we have be safe, be safe, be safe, be respectful, be responsible, do your best. So we have those four. In any environment we go into, we can teach what, what it means to be successful based on those four criteria. It's really helpful when you start trying to simplify and unify your behavior support in your home environment. When you start looking about what does it mean to be safe in the kitchen? What does it mean to be respectful in the kitchen? What does it mean to be responsible in the kitchen? What does it mean to be uh, to do your best in the kitchen? And restaurants and living rooms and all these kinds of things where the home environment, so what you do is you start to, uh, because the biggest problem people have is kids don't know what to do until they've done it wrong and then they get corrected or they get told once. So a good, strong, positive behavior support structure at home has those shared expectations and then moves into good teaching systems. Uh, they, they, we have where we've intentionally taught, you know, we, this, all, this is a, one that's been used a thousand times, which is we can't read, we teach, swim, we teach, multiply, we teach, kid can't drive, we teach. But if a kid doesn't know how to behave, commonly we defer to a punishment type approach. So this is one of those situations where I feel like we, you know, we get caught up in this word of should. You know, kids should know how to do this and should know how to do that. You know, and, and this is just to show you that it isn't all about being cute. Um, the best people at ignoring should is the military. When you show up to the military, when you go to basic training, they don't care where you came from, how much money you had, what your parents were like. They assume you know nothing. They teach you how to stand, speak, take care of your clothes, all that stuff, because they don't want to waste time with should this and should that and all these kinds of things. So I think that's a real powerful thing to take from them is, you know, you may think your kids know how to do this, that, and the next thing, but the teaching systems are so powerful. Another mistake that we see people make is this concept of leaning on uh, motivation before skill. What does that mean? Motivation before skill is this. If I try to incentivize something that a person doesn't have skill for, I'll actually work against myself. So when I look at that, you know, the example I give that's an easy one is with like basketball. If, if, if I tell someone to dunk a basketball, if you ask me to dunk a basketball, I can't dunk a basketball, but you don't know that. So what you say is, well, I'll give you a hundred dollars if you dunk the basketball. So what you do is you're increasing my incentive. By increasing my incentive, you increase my motivation, but I still don't have the skill. So I still haven't learned. I don't know how, or I can't, but then you say, well, he's not motivated enough. I'm going to, I'm going to up it. I'm going to give him $200. So now what you've done is you've increased my motivation, but I still don't have the skills. So now that motivation, because energy can't be created or destroyed. It can only transfer forms. Now that motivation turns into frustration shame. I hate basketball. I don't like the person that gave me the challenge. So you got to be real careful. Like I'm all about feedback systems. I think feedback systems are important, but if you put feedback in front of skill, you actually will um, frustrate people. And I think this one thing I see in homes and in schools is people will go to that kid and say, hey buddy, if you can be good for nine weeks, we're going to let you play in the jump house and eat hot and ready pizzas. And, and that kid just doesn't have the behavioral muscle or the skill to pull that off. And, and that then incentive becomes uh, uh, something that then feeds their frustration in, in that way. You got to be careful with that with your own kids in your own home environment too. Always go skill before you go motivation. And teaching systems are just that. You know, you have to think about it as it's, it's model first. If you want kids to be respectful, you got to be respectful. If you want kids to be safe, you got to be safe. If you want kids to be responsible, you got to see you being responsible. And then going into practicing context, you know, practicing things like uh, cooking and things in the kitchen, practicing things like hand washing, 
practicing things about being respectful and responsible in Walmart or practicing what it means to have good manners in uh, Wendy's or a fancy restaurant or wherever it might be. I think this is something that we commonly don't do enough of is we don't build in the expectations in the teaching systems. So that's a big part of that that we have to take into consideration. The next one we, we go into is this feedback and acknowledgement. Again, I said skill before uh, motivation, but now that we have the skills through the teaching systems, we do need to look at feedback systems, feedback and acknowledgement. Because one of the things I've said over and over again, if it's important enough to teach and important enough to punish, it's important enough to acknowledge. You know, we got to close the loop. We got to have the behavior, we've taught the behavior, the behavior is executed, we'll get the feedback on the behavior. If you get a chance, probably a good book to look at how, um, Feedback is, is different for different people. Uh, the Chapman, Chapman books on love languages, especially for kids, is great. It just shows how people respond um, more or less to different types of feedback. Some kids want stuff. Some kids want time. Some kids want, uh, you know, words of affirmation. So getting better at understanding the different love languages that people have make you a better parent and a better teacher in that specific way. And, and also, when we talk about in the home environment, is really looking at discipline procedures. It's one of the things that I think if you have a, a family environment where there's two adults in the home, is this is where, you know, uh, physical aggression or unprovoked physical aggression results in this, or not doing your homework results in this. Because what happens is if we don't get better about our discipline procedures, then we're more emotionally dependent and personality dependent. So if I don't have my homework uh, done, and mom catches me, this is the consequence. If dad catches me, this is the consequence. Remember, the brain's a pattern-seeking device, and what it does is it uses the patterns to predict the future. And what creates anxiety is inconsistency or broken patterns. So if we have inconsistent uh, discipline patterns, what's gonna happen is we're gonna have uh, anxious kids. And different kids will respond to anxiety in different ways. Some kids will respond to anxiety by going within themselves, which is like shutting down. Other kids will respond to anxiety by um, becoming more dominant. I've seen kids with overindulgent parents that become tyrants because there's no leadership in their home. So that's a big thing that you start to see. And also, you know, a big part of positive behavior support is looking at um, what do you want to work on? You know, what things, what are areas where we need to show growth or need to show improvement? I think that's a big thing. Um, you know, this isn't something that's typical. We've used Class Dojo at my house before, uh, lately. There's a variety of apps and things like that that you can use, but the reason why you use uh, data is to look at, are we getting gains in the things we want to see? Like, for example, if you have a kid had lots of meltdowns, you might look at measuring frequency, intensity, duration of, of a meltdown. If you're looking at things like disrespect, whatever it might be, you target those things. And then from the target, you then work on the expectations and the teaching systems, which then naturally translate, translates into we should see. Uh, you get what you focus on, you get what you tolerate. That's Mickey Mariotti, he's a, a strength coach at Ohio State. Yeah. You get what you focus on and you get what you tolerate. So knowing what to focus on and knowing what to tolerate is, is where data analysis comes into, uh, comes into the equation. As you move up the pyramid, and I know I'm going fast, but that's just the nature of an hour long uh, webinar. Um, the, the next one we start looking at is these targeted social emotional support. So now we've got the, 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 the effective workforce, which is our state and story. We've got nurturing relationships. We've talked about a high quality sport environment. Now let's start how we target social emotional growth and learning. Um, the first place I would say is we start with understanding emotion, energy management, understanding our kids profile for what things drain their tank and what things fill up their tank. Excuse me, anybody that's had, had small children know, you remember when your kids were so tired that they couldn't get out of their own way? They were so tired, like they were completely irrational. And, all they, and it didn't matter how much you timed the time out or uh, you know, read a book or did a puppet show, none of that mattered. They needed to sleep It's because they were out of energy. Oftentimes I feel like this is a great place for people to start, to start thinking about where is your, the, understanding the energy usage for your child what things drain them and what things fill them up. And we talked about the four A's earlier. We talked about anxiety, autism, ADHD, and ACEs. And they all have these, these, this thing in common, which is regulatory fatigue, um, which commonly relates to executive functioning, sensory processing, things like that. So we've got to help kids. We've got to help be thoughtful of keeping our kids in a place where we're not um, asking too much of them based on what kind of gas they have in their tank. Knowing that going to, for example, going to church, is exhausting for your kid. Making sure that we're doing something in the morning before church 
to, to, to get their tank as full as possible. And then we don't ask too much of them after church. You know, I give you an example. If you got a kid who's uh, struggling with, uh, you know, I'll just say anxiety, you know, he's a, he's a very anxious kid. What can I do with him ahead of church? Because if, but let's say I, I don't think of that. And I take him to church and there's all these people and all this stuff and people want to touch and not, da, 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 da. And then after that, we take him to a, a fancy restaurant. And then, so then we're like piling on all this stuff. And then we wonder why 30 minutes into the, the fancy restaurant, you can do ADHD or autism as well, that he's melting down. It's because he's out, his gas tank's empty. So we have to be thoughtful and understand. Now, can we increase the capacity of his tank? Yes, but that takes time. And there's a lot of moving parts with that. And that's where if you read Stuart Shanker's book, Self-Reg, he talks a lot about that. So we gotta be thoughtful of regulatory fatigue. We gotta be thought of when a child is hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. That's what HALT stands for. That's taken from a lot of the addictions work. So being thoughtful of those things. Being thoughtful of how sensory experiences, like the brain work, sensational brain work uh, information can help to help that kid get aligned. How visuals can take some of the neurological load off that child to increase their energy capacity. Um, another strategy I found, and this sounds somewhat ridiculous that we bring it up this way, but is 100% play um, or 100% interaction. What that means is the best way that kids social and emotionally grow is by being engaged in uh, reciprocal interaction with adults and peers. So 100% uh, play is do you have time where you know, uh, where you're in the car and you're purposely interacting in what uh, Stanley Greenspan talked about, circles of communication, where I'm talking, you respond. I'm talking, you respond. That's how you learn to be in conversation, is by being in a conversation and being taught how to be in a conversation. Or, uh, you know, good game I found with kids that work on reciprocity are uh, games where we're uh, passing a ball back and forth or uh, taking turns. This 100% play element is just huge. And, and one of the things I found is it doesn't have to be uh, so driven on, I'm here to teach you a skill. It's organic. And that's what Greenspan, Stanley Greenspan, he developed the four-time four model, talked a lot about, which was, you know, creating a space where you go into the child's world and use the child's world as an opportunity to connect and grow and develop those skills. So 100% play can't be, uh, can't be overvalued. And I think, you know, I, I've even put this in behavior plans where we've had kids that, uh, they just need connection and they need uh, skill development. 100% play is the best place for them to get it. You're going to hear a lot of things around emotional literacy. Um, if you go on the, the West Virginia Behavior Mental Health Technical Assistance Center YouTube page, Alicia Zeman has a fantastic YouTube, but she's our positive behavior support, school-wide positive behavior support coordinator. Uh, she has a fantastic video on emotional literacy at home. I, I'd really encourage you to take a look at it. It's great. Um, and, uh, and Dr. Amy Carlson has one on there too as well that talks about social emotional instruction and we can share those YouTube pages in the chat box uh, if it hasn't been shared already. Um, and then look, and then we start working toward this idea of emotional intelligence. Always, always uh, Daniel Goleman's book, Emotional Intelligence, w was huge. But one of the things I think we talk about is I'll say this kid needs to work on his social skills. My goodness, is that a compl complicated thing? Social skills sound simple enough, but in order to have social skills, there's a, a, um, a sequence that is essential to be high level at your social skills. First of all, in order to have social skills, you have to have emotional awareness for yourself. Um, you have to have a sense of your own uh, feelings, your own thoughts, your own state. Second, you have to be able to, in some degree, manage your own emotional state. Third, you have to be able to acknowledge that other people feel differently and have different emotional states. Fourth, you have to be able to manage your behavior based upon your assessment of their behavior and emotional state. So if we start talking about uh, uh, you know, social skills, my goodness, that's complicated because we've got all these different areas and levels between how am I feeling, how am I regulating, how are they feeling, how are they regulating, and how am I gonna interact taking into account all these things. So just to say we're gonna do social skills um, is, is, a, is a broad brush, um, but we do learn those things somewhat seamlessly uh, in, in general, but there are kids that are going to struggle more with specific areas, self-awareness, self-regulation, awareness of others. Like, for example, if I have a kid who um, is not very self-aware, uh, he may sense other people and get other people, but he doesn't know how to regulate himself. But let's say a kid, a kid has theory of mind problems. Uh, he, may, you know, he, he may not understand how other people are feeling, so that's going to be complicated. So we look at these things like emotional uh, literacy, friendship, anger, and impulse control, teaching kids how to decode. I've got a lot of younger examples on here, but this also relates to older kids too. Teaching kids, increasing their emotional vocabulary from just 
happy and mad to happy, mad, disappointed, confused, angry, you know, all these different emotions. That's when we start talking about increasing emotional literacy, you know, um, and then you start looking at being able to decode facial expressions, you know, decode feelings, uh, even a step back. And this is from, uh, you know, even being able to report how you're feeling. I've used uh, feelings thermometers as we've used this in our childhood ECPBIS curriculum and a variety of other things. But this is just trying to teach kids how they, uh, to get kids to start to connect with sensation and thoughts with feelings and reporting. So green, you know, I, had, I even worked this with a young man um, who had intellectual challenges and, and uh, he was 15 years old and, and, every, and he really struggled to communicate how he's feeling. And, and so we just talked about green, yellow, red. Green's he's good to go, he's ready, to, he can do whatever needs to be done. Uh, yellow is he's struggling and red means he's, he's mad and he's locked up. And Ross Green talks a little bit about this too with the book, The Explosive Child in a little more complicated fashion. But what we look at with this is creating a common vocabulary for emotional literacy. So this is a good place to start. It's color-based, it's easy. I've used this from pre-K all the way up into adults even. Um, and teaching people how to communicate how they're feeling and then to, uh, you know, I've had some kids when we have a behavior plan where we'll do this and we have a plan for what we do to help you when you're green. What do you need from us when you're yellow? And what do you need from us when you're red? And different kids may have different needs at different levels. So that's just something to think about. Another great book, which is a great process, is the incredible five-point scale. Um, you know, we uh, have seen this used in a, in a variety of ways. Uh, our executive director, Dr. Mark Ellison, actually used this to work with a young man um, that was uh, having trouble communicating his emotional state, and they used the incredible five-point scale as a way to providing variance and understanding of his emotional state. It's going to be really helpful. It's a great book. We also have that on our um, Facebook, if you get a chance, our Facebook page for the ATC is, is fantastic too. There's lots of cool stuff that shows up on there. That's how you keep up to speed on us as well. Here's where we take that incredible five point scale and also put it on that Bandurian curve. Uh, some kids, they can really uh, help with that. Uh, we know that using books and literacy is helpful. You know, a great uh, children's book on Monday when it rained is a great book that introduces a variety of emotional states. Another one of my favorites, probably my favorite children's book for regulation is I Can Handle It. Love that book. Um, it's, it's a kid that has some disappointing things happen and it talks about how he's going to handle it. Uh, for older kids, I, th I find it's better to find a topic that they're already interested in uh, with different characters and have them connect with those characters. Uh, even as much so as it sounds crazy, when I was a, um, a therapist, I would use uh, the Harry Potter characters if the kid was interested in Harry Potter. Um, I'd use the Twilight characters if, uh, if a young person was having relationship issues and, and uh, we needed to talk about uh, the things like that. Uh, you know, teenagers are a little bit more uh, suspicious of being, uh, having things done to them and not done with them. So you wanna use topic areas they're interested in. I've even used music interests. I've had everything from Eminem to Avenge Sevenfold to use as uh, emotional literacy uh, entry points, really just kind of entering the world at their place. Um, you know, one of the things you will commonly see, there is a, a great strategy out there called Tucker the Turtle. Uh, that we use a lot of for young kids for anger and impulse control. Uh, Sarah Smouse, our early childhood behavior support specialist on our YouTube channel, the Behavior and Mental Health Technical Assistance Center YouTube channel, has a fantastic video on how to use this specific strategy to work with kids. Uh, just as a really effective way. Again, my older kids, uh, you know, I've, I've introduced this to older kids in private to simplify it, cartoon it, and then say, all right, and then uh, I've had some older kids we've used. That one little guy, his area of interest was, uh, he loved superheroes, so we used the Hulk um, and just showed this progression um, of how to stay Bruce Banner. If you don't know the Hulk, that won't make any sense, but if you do, you know what I mean. Um, so, you know, really, and it's one of the things I, I always want to tell people is the strategy isn't about the turtle. It's about what the, what the turtle's trying to teach. It's the underlying uh, lesson that the lesson's trying to teach. Um, you know, and also, you know, and I, I won't go too far into this, but I do talk a lot about the conflict triangle, especially for people working with adolescents, is um, keeping the focus on the problem and not the people. Um, kids are, and teenagers especially, are really good at going into the you're mean, you don't want me to have a happy life, and all you're do is make me miserable. And I really try to work a lot with parents on the idea of keeping the focus on the problem. Like if my kid comes in, if, if he, if I say to be in at eight and he comes in at eight 30 and um, the, the consequence is he's going to be grounded, for example, just make it easy. 
the, the kid might look at me and say, you're being mean. You just want me to stay home because you're lonely and miserable, blah, 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 blah. If I take the bait on that and start arguing that I'm not mean and things like that, then I'm going to take the focus away from the problem, which was that they were late. So I collapsed the triangle is what I'm doing in that situation. But keeping the focus on, listen, um, we, I was very clear that after eight o'clock, you were late. If you're late, this is a consequence. I realize you're upset. I see that you're upset. Um, but this is what the consequence is going to be. T too often people get, they take the bait of the disrespect and then they lose track of the actual consequence and the actual uh, behavior that they were addressing and, and, and get into the, when I was a kid stuff and everybody gets mad and somebody ends up crying, but we still don't really uh, keep the focus on the problem. I'm not telling you you should let kids be disrespectful, but I am saying that too often people through a lack of their own self-regulation lose track of what the focus of the intervention should be. Uh, progressive earning systems are along in how we're gonna teach social emotional uh, skill, which is um, showing kids how to work toward um, things, showing kids how to chain together positive behaviors. Um, you know, I talked earlier about feedback and acknowledgement systems. You know, feedback and acknowledgement systems are, we close the loop. Um, you know, hey, man, you get uh, five days in a row of, of getting your homework taken care of. Uh, you can work towards something you want to work toward. I tend to favor no cost, low cost uh, uh, pro-social reinforcers. What I mean by that is I like kids to work towards experiences with other people as opposed to stuff. I think the treasure box is, has been overused. Um, now, are there kids who respond very well to tangible things? Yes. And listen, um, you know, we have some kids that uh, just have such limited areas of interest. You do have to focus on those areas of interest. But if at all possible, I prefer uh, experiences. I prefer pro-social experiences, no cost. You've got to be careful because, you know, we don't want kids to get um, uh, stuff addicted, so to speak, um, where it's all about flipping Skittles at them uh, when they do a good job. You know, it's, it's, I really want us to get some depth in that reinforcement, if at all possible. And pairing even tangibles with pro-social can be helpful as well. Last but certainly not least, as we move to the top of the triangle, which is our more intensive behaviors. These are when the behaviors reach a level of, you know, uh, potential safety issues, uh, meltdowns, danger, aggression, things like that. Um, I'm always going to encourage folks that you never go in on this alone. You know, uh, this is one where you're probably going to need to reach out to, you know, birth to three, the special ed teachers in your building, a therapist, uh, the autism training center, um, you know, the adolescent health specialist in your, these kind of folks that are, that are gonna help rally around you. You know, cause a good process is we're gonna have to have that team. We're gonna gather that information. We're gonna try to get a feeling of what's going on with this behavior. We're gonna design and develop plans. And we're gonna implement, monitor and revise. Um, and this is something I feel like that even as me as a parent, I would want an outside perspective to help me develop my mindset in this. And, and I think this is one where you gotta get a team around you. You know, you gotta get folks to help you. You gotta get some expertise at the table. You know, this might be a place where you do a clinical evaluation, where you do a psychological evaluation to, to say, gosh, there's more to this than what we realize. And, you know, when we start dealing with things like, uh, you know, executive function problems, sensory integration, we might need, need to bring in an OT. We might need to, might need to bring in a PT. Um, you know, those kinds of folks, because commonly behavior is very complicated and it has a variety of layers when it reaches a level of extreme meltdown and things like that. Now, also what I have seen too is, let's say a kid that had a fairly manageable behavior at the age of like, you know, eight or nine, but it's not been dealt with effectively and now they're 14. The problem, the problem with that is, you know, it's like trying to stop a horse that's running full speed it can be a very uh, difficult process because there's so much behavioral momentum behind it. And that's sometimes why having teams around can be helpful. I've had, you know, a 15 year old come in or a family, uh, a parent bring a 15 year old in who's basically out of control, but they don't really have any kind of neurological like classic diagnosis, but they've been, uh, they've developed into this and um, the parents just kind of in over their head and they need help with, um, with figuring out how to, uh, how, how to, uh, to, to get control of this situation that really isn't uh, medical in nature, but it's, it's still got a lot of momentum behind it. And it's not a quick fix because the kid just, uh, again, the brain's pattern seeking device. So the kid sees the patterns that have been going on and just kind of leaves it be. And then at tier three though, we just understand that all behavior is purposeful, you know, trying to get a sense of, you know, uh, 
why, it, where is the disrespect coming from? Where is the aggression coming from? You know, one of the things I talk a lot about, especially with kids with uh, developmental issues, um, is a lot of times behavior communication, always behavior communication. What's he trying to tell us? You know, when we do behavior plans, I'll say like, what's this kid's behavior trying to tell us? So what are we gonna, how are we going to, um, you know, try to decode? And oftentimes you'll see the functional behavioral assessment, the job of the functional behavioral assessment is to decode what the behavior is trying to tell us. Um, but when we're developing these plans, we always think of safety first. When I've got a kid that has a potential for uh, disrupting safety, uh, the first thing I always ask the team is, what's the worst thing this kid's gonna do? Because everybody's thinking it. And if we don't address it early, what happens is um, we, we leave it in the back of people's minds. So address safety first. Do we have a kid who's gonna run out into traffic? Do we have a kid that potentially could use a weapon to hurt somebody? Do we, excuse me, do we have a kid who, uh, you know, whatever those worst case scenarios might be. And then we build those safety protocols. And because when people typically, when I found kids with extremely challenging behavior, typically how people get hurt is um, not having a good plan during crisis, um, not practicing during crisis. Um, you know, we, we see that a lot with uh, restraints and things like that, where uh, people get emotionally overwhelmed and, and then they uh, react that their body is pretending, is, is acting as if they're in a fight, not as if they're in a safety providing situation. Um, so I think this is one of those areas where we really got to dig in uh, to safety protocols and practicing rehearsal, what ifs. Um, this is an area where I think people get afraid to go down this road but I've also seen uh, some really bad things happen because people uh, would want to kind of have their head in the sand about this. Um, what makes a good plan is not the first draft. And this is from Horner's work. You know, one of the things that, and this number uh, could be revised or debated, I guess, but what Horner talked a lot about years ago was that your first draft plan is gonna have about a 33% success rate. So if I'm doing a behavior plan, if I've reached, if my tier one and tier two strategies are, are, are helping, but I've still got a kid with extreme behavior, um, that first draft probably plus or minus is going to have about a 33% success rate, which means it's going to be mostly wrong. So the difference is, isn't the beautiful, when I first started writing plans, man, I always thought it was about creating this beautiful plan, but it's about creating a effective team at revising the plan. Cause if it's going to be mostly wrong, the difference is going to be, does the, is the team good at evaluating and, and revising? The plan is a good is a team good at collecting data, analyzing the data, revising the plan based on what the data says, and continuing to monitor. So you know the the the, the plan is a living document to steal that as a kind of cliche thing to say a lot, but it's a living document that then uh, re responds to the needs of the behavior the, the child based on the behavior. So we have that data analysis again where we're monitoring our outcomes. A big problem I notice with sometimes is that people make data collection too complicated, families don't wanna do it. Uh, keep it simple, you know, keep it simple. Uh, you know, make sure it's easy to track. Things like apps like uh, Dojo can be helpful, basic tick charts, uh, not trying to track everything under the sun, but focusing on some specific behaviors is important. And understanding the, the need to revise and regroup and, and understand that coming back together and of a plan. One of my pet peeves though is, um, you know, if a plan isn't as being as effective or the plan starts to kind of fall down a little bit, is this people think, you know, plane shoots and ladders. Like, oh, well, you know, that plan didn't work. We're starting back at square one. And, and even saying that to kids, that's probably my worst thing is when people say to a kid, oh, we were doing so well, and then you had this bad day and we're back to square one. That is so defeating and such shooting yourself in the foot because you're not back at square one because that kid had some good days in a row, and those days can't be neurologically taken from that kid. So – you know, it's, it's, it's eight, we had a setback, we had a rough day. Um, yeah, we didn't, you didn't do the things you knew how to do, but what are we gonna do better next time? Um, oftentimes people use that, we're starting all over as, an op as, a, as a way to create shame. And then they create, they think shame is a good motivator. Shame is a horrible motivator. Shame creates defensiveness or inactivity. So shame by itself is a horrible uh, motivator. Um, you know, it's, it's, it, it actually makes people just want to escape the, the situations where shame is provided. If shame worked, we'd just wait, we'd weigh everybody in, in front of all their friends, and then ridicule them as they don't lose weight, and then uh, and expect that their motivating factor would be the fact that they, uh, they were shamed into behaving. Um, you know, and, and, and the thing I'll just mention to folks, and we'll get wrapped up and go to some questions if there are any, 
um, is, uh, you know, it's, it's about 40% know-how and about 60% want to. Um, you know, I, I'll, take, I'll take action, you know, I'll, I'll take action because if, you, if we know that the plan is 33% wrong or right, tw two thirds wrong, then we have to keep moving to work toward what's gonna work. So that's why that's so important that when we're looking at planning and even uh, in the house, even at tier one and tier two, you know, gosh, our expectations aren't working or our, our uh, teaching systems aren't working or my kid's not learning this, that, or the next thing. So it's really about that activity in that specific way. So um, here's, here's how to track us down at the ATC. You know, it's, a, it's our webpage, that's my email. Um, I'll, I'll try to see if we can, if they haven't already been posted in the chat box, we'll, pack, we'll, we'll post the uh, ATC YouTube page. We'll post the, uh, the, the other information with um, uh, all the other websites so that way folks can see those, uh, the ATC YouTube, the Behavioral Mental Health Technical Assistance YouTube. There's some great videos on there that are very instructional and our websites for those as well. So um, goodness gracious, that's a lot of talking. Um, I hope some of it was helpful. I never can tell because I, I'm, I'm kind of by myself in a room. So uh, uh, any questions or comments? Uh, Melody, you got anything for me? That's awesome information, Jim. Let's see here. We have had a couple. You did end up answering some as you went through it, but somebody was wondering at the end if you could go over the authors he mentioned when you were talking about the three S's. Oh. Um, state story and strategy. Yes. Yeah, that was Tony Robbins. I'll put it in the chat box. It, 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 everybody knows who he is. He's that uh, he's that self help guru guy. Um, is Tony Robbins? If you just type in Tony Robbins in YouTube and uh, state story and strategy, uh, he talks a lot about that. Uh, I'll put it in the chat box now. Okay. Somebody did ask us a question about whether you would be sharing your slides with us today and providing a link for that. Absolutely. I will be. Um, in fact, um, I can, while you're doing that, what I'll do is I'll create a link right now and I'll put it in the chat box, the, a PDF version of it, um, if that's helpful. Awesome. So again, what Jim's going to do is he's going to put that link in the chat box right now, but as with each week, any resources or uh, presentations that the speaker is sharing will be emailed to you as well. So you should get those both ways. Are there any other questions that anybody has for Dr. Harris? You can feel free to put them in the chat box or the Q&A box as we can see them. Uh, yes, to the person who said that they arrived late, you're gonna get a link to the video for this. Any opportunity for anybody to ask any specific questions for Dr. Harris at this time? Uh, somebody was wondering if you could possibly just give us a list of those authors he cited. Yes, I'll communicate with Dr. Harris. We'll get a list of any of the authors that he cited during his presentation, and we'll include that in the email that will go out to you. Melody, what I'll do is I'll get the, all those links together and links to some of the books uh, that I mentioned, and, and I'll send those to you, and that way those can go out in the communication. Awesome. You spoke about uh, Dr. Gary Chapman's book, The Five Love Languages. For those of you that do have teenagers or work with adolescents, I highly recommend that you read the five love languages of teenagers because teenagers are, uh, are creatures of a different time. And it's really important that we understand when we're working with them that all of those five love languages play in. So I really encourage you to read both of those books, some of the best material I've ever read. Um, PowerPoint from last week. Oh, I may have not sent that like link to Deb. So we'll get the link to my presentation from last week out too as well. Do I have any more questions relevant to today for Dr. Harris before I don't take uh, any more of his time? Is there anything else, Jim, you felt like you flew through that you wanna add before I take it over? No, no, I, I appreciate folks taking the time, um, you know, and, and it, I appreciate the opportunity, Melody, you know, I. I we're trying to help everybody out in this situation, but I do think there's things we can do. I really do believe there's things we can do. Um, I know it feels a little bit powerless right now because there's so much out of our control. Um, 
but I, I think we got to focus on what we can control as much as possible and and try not try our best not to just be victims of our circumstance but acknowledging that the, that the world's complicated right now absolutely there's been great feedback in the chat box and one person did indicate it is and i felt the same way an hour is a short period of time to deliver a lot of important information that's why we wanted to videotape the webinar series so that you could go back and review it and watch it as many times as you need to you don't have to take notes through it so um, please do feel free it's a lot of information and we really appreciate you taking the time jim because i know as a speaker myself that an hour is a short period of time when and when you have a lot of information you want to share. So we really appreciate it. Yeah, being quiet is not my strong suit. Everybody knows that's, <laughs> anybody's listened to me before, but I appreciate everybody taking the time. It's, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for your time too. I'm going to take back over control here so we can go over a few things. Um, some general housekeeping. So this is that time that I just remind you to remember to fill out an evaluation. The link's been provided to you in the chat box. Do you make sure that you get your name on your sign-in sheet? If you have any complications at all, let myself or Lisa know. We're happy to help you out. We are very excited to announce, as we've mentioned before, that we will continue the training series through the rest of the month. So we're adding to Connect West Virginia a 3.0 training series, and it is a welcoming schools training series. You're going to be emailed the flyer out with the link to register. It will take place the last two weeks of July, the 22nd and the 29th at the same time of day, same day of the week. Welcoming Schools is an innovative program geared towards schools with elementary grades and is for administrators, educators, support personnel, and parents and guardians who want to strengthen their school's approach to family diversity, gender stereotyping and bullying, and help prepare children to live in an increasingly diverse society. The lessons are in line with safe and supportive schools. Training is necessary. Training is necessary first step to building a more welcoming school climate. Each week we'll have a little bit of a different content. So please review that um, and information about our presenter and join us towards the end of the month. You guys have registered before. The flyer will look the same. Um, really appreciate you guys all taking the time to be with us once again. Next week, we're going to hear from Kathy Zafron. Very excited. She's going to talk about uh, supportive resources for our foster families um, in West Virginia. So please join us again next week. If you are participating in